Intracranial pressure. As the capillaries leak in response to injury, brain tissue swelling occurs within the confining limits of the bony cranium. The pressure within the brain tissue rises, compressing cerebral blood vessels and decreasing blood flow. This reduced cerebral capillary perfusion results in tissue hypoxia, anoxia, ischemia, and cell death. Papilledema occurs when the optic disc swells and is usually bilateral and can occur over a period of hours to weeks and is associated with increased intracranial pressure. The assessment begins with airway breathing, circulation, and disability. As always, establish and maintain an airway is top priority. Deliver supplemental oxygen using a bag valve mass device until a definitive airway is placed. Ensure that the patient has two large bore IVs and that they're still intact and patent. If volume resuscitation becomes necessary, use warm isotonic saline as it is the fluid of choice for head injury patients because it won't aggravate cerebral edema. Now remember your fluids. Isotonic, it does not cause a fluid shift. It's not in the cell. It's not out of the cell. It leaves everything where it is, but it will increase the volume. Hypotonic solution causes fluid shift into the cells. And any time fluid is shifted into the cells, the patient is at risk for an elevated ICP. When fluids are being shifted into the cell, it is coming out of the cardiovascular system and this is causing a risk for a cardiovascular collapse because the movement of fluid is going where it is not supposed to be. It causes an elevated ICP, there's a risk for cardiovascular collapse and third spacing. Hypertonic causes a fluid shift out of the cells. It dehydrates the cells. When a cell is placed in hypertonic solution, the water diffuses or moves out of the cell, causing the cell to shrivel. Hypertonic solution has been used for volume resuscitation in traumatic brain injury patients that have been shown to reduce ICP. Dextrose and water, D5W, should be avoided because it tends to leave the vascular space rather quickly and promoting swelling. Fluids given to trauma patients, especially those to be given in large volumes, should be placed on a fluid warmer to prevent hypothermia. The goal is to maintain a systolic blood pressure above 90 millimeters of mercury. If blood loss is greater than 30% of the total blood volume, then blood products should be used as part of the volume resuscitation. Intubation and mechanical ventilation are necessary if the patient cannot maintain or protect their airway because of level of consciousness is depressed. Adequate oxygenation is a PaO2 at 100 millimeters of mercury or greater. The blood gas analysis would help guide the oxygen therapy because the patient may require a mechanical ventilator. Intubation and ventilation are also necessary if the patient is in danger of losing their airway because of swelling from a neck or pharyngeal injury or if expected to deteriorate neurologically. The patient with a traumatic brain injury has or is at high risk for increased ICP as the mechanisms that normally compensate for changes in ICP are compromised, ICP increases in response to a variety of stimuli. By monitoring for symptoms of ICP, it enables the nurse to evaluate the ability to integrate commands with conscious and involuntary movement. Nurses monitor for changes in vital signs such as bradycardia and tachycardia, varying breathing patterns, hypertension, or a widening pulse pressure. Cushing's triad is bradycardia, increased systolic pressure and increased pulse pressure and could indicate brainstem ischemia leading to cerebral herniation. Diuretics are often prescribed to prevent increases in ICP, anticonvulsants are prescribed to prevent or control seizures, and antibiotics are prescribed to eradicate bacteria. Dexamethasone is given to control cerebral edema secondary to the injury or for brain tumors, and fluids may be restricted to help prevent an increase in ICP. Hyperventilation therapy was the mainstay in treatment, but now found that aggressive hyperventilation increases the risk of focal cerebral ischemia and adversely affects the outcome. Brief periods may be useful for refractory intracranial hypertension. Remember that the brain, blood, and cerebral spinal fluid are encased in a rigid cavity. There is no room to expand or increase in volume. So an inflammatory response causes capillary permeability, which is the leading cause of death in a closed head injury. The first response of the body is to shunt the cerebral spinal fluid to the spinal area or to increase cerebral spinal fluid reabsorption. If compensation can take place, the increase in ICP and development of symptoms can be delayed. 
As ICP increases, the cerebral blood flow decreases, resulting in tissue hypoxia and increase in CO2. This results in cerebral vasodilation. Edema can cause herniation and brainstem and push down through the foramen magnum due to the increase in intracranial pressure. Downward displacement puts pressure on the cranial nerves, causing fixed dilated pupils. Although hyperventilation can rapidly lower ICP in some patients, it can also result in markedly reduced cerebral blood flow. Short-term use may help improve neurologic recovery. Hyperventilation may be necessary for the brief periods in patients with severe neurological deterioration because the ICP cannot be lowered by other methods such as sedation. Remember that PaCO2 is 35 plus or minus 2. That would make the acceptable range 33 to 37 millimeters of mercury. After a moderate or severe head injury, patients use more energy as their body's metabolism is working at a greater rate. When intracranial pressure cannot be controlled by other means, patients may be placed in a barbiturate coma to decrease cerebral metabolic demands, decrease formation of vasogenic edema, and produce a more uniform blood supply to the brain. Neuromuscular blocking agents are used to chemically paralyze a patient, but they have no analgesic effect and should never be used without sedation. Never, ever. A head injury increases the body's nutritional requirements, which may lead to malnutrition and other complications. Patients are often unable to meet the increased requirements by oral feeding alone, and even if oral feeding is possible, other methods may be required. Some can be started on oral feeding immediately following a head injury, but others may be delayed until the digestive system is found to be functioning. TPN, total parenteral nutrition, provides an alternative to conventional enteral feedings. TPN, though, can carry risks of infectious complications. In patients with long-term alterations in consciousness, such as a vegetative state or locked-in syndrome, measures to maintain nutritional status are initiated. Enteral feeds with a gastrostomy tube are preferred if the patient is unable to take enough food by mouth without aspirating. These patients will need protein, calories, zinc, and vitamin C, especially for wound healing. Monitoring the bladder distension and bowel constipation. Administer stool softeners and use the crede technique, which is applying pressure to the suprapubic region with the fingers on one or both hands to empty the bladder. If the Curday method is not effective, evaluate the pros and cons of urinary catheterization if the bladder remains distended. Constipation and bladder distension increase interthoracic or intraabdominal pressure and place the patient at risk for impaired venous drainage from the brain. Another goal is to reduce spasticity, encouraging range of motion exercises in the absence of increased ICP. Make sure the neck is in neutral position. An active range of motion maintains or improves muscle strength, endurance, and help to maintain cardiopulmonary function. But remember, even active range of motion should be in the absence of increased ICP. The external ventricular drain or ventriculostomy, otherwise known as a ventric, is a device used in neurosurgery that relieves elevated intracranial pressure and hydrocephalus when the normal flow of cerebral spinal fluid around the brain is obstructed. The catheter is normally inserted on the right side of the brain. The monitoring system helps show whether blood flow to the brain is adequate. If the patient begins to run a temperature, then the external ventricular drain may need to be pulled out and the antibiotics are started. The patient's airway should be maintained and optimal ventilation. Head of the bed should be about 15 to 30 degrees and all ADLs that increase ICP should be spaced. Limit suctioning and never schedule suctioning. It is only as needed. When a patient does need suctioning, then hyperoxygenate with 100% O2 for 60 seconds before suctioning. Additional nursing interventions would be to have a calm environment and prevent hyperthermia. Bleeding commonly occurs along the external ventricular drain insertion tract or in the several layers of the meninges that prohibit passage into the brain. If drilling or dural puncture is not successful, then a dissection away from the dura could create a secondary bleed known as an epidural or subdural hemorrhage. This situation can be life-threatening and requires neurosurgical care. 
The most dreaded bleeding complication is the realistic possibility of passing the external ventricular drain catheter through a major vessel or existing aneurysm. If this happens, the likelihood of death is significantly increased and may be immediate. The risk of hemorrhage is increased if the patient is having coagulopathies. Another complication is obstruction or occlusion of the external ventricular drain commonly due to a fibrinous clot-like material or kinking of the tube. The brain can swell due to pressure buildup in the ventricles and permanent brain damage can occur. Another complication is migration. During the external ventricular drain, the drain is tunneled subcutaneously and anchored with sutures. However, it is common for the drain to dislodge or migrate. This will cause the tip of the drain to migrate away from its supposed position and provide inaccurate ICP measurement or total occlusion of the drain. Another complication is infection. The external ventricular drain is a foreign body inserted into the human body. It can serve as an object for bacterial attachment and cause an ascending infection. Cushing's triad is systolic hypertension with widening pulse pressure, bradycardia, and respiratory changes. This indicates the intracranial pressure has increased and the brain herniation may be imminent unless immediate action is taken to reduce ICP. Now looking at cerebral perfusion pressure, intracranial pressure, and cerebral blood flow. To maintain cerebral blood flow, it is necessary to keep cerebral perfusion pressure in the range of 70 to 100 millimeters of mercury. If the cerebral perfusion pressure is less than 60, this indicates hypoperfusion. When autoregulation is impaired, the cerebral blood flow fluctuates with changes in the systemic blood pressure. This may be seen in a patient that has suction or coughs, which causes a rise in blood pressure, resulting in an elevated ICP. Treatment modalities for increased ICP would be to maintain airway breathing circulation. Controlled ventilation can induce hypocapnia, but it can cause vasoconstriction and reduce cerebral blood flow. So the PaCO2 should be 35 plus or minus 2. Remember, 33 to 37. Keep the ICP less than 15 millimeters of mercury and give volume to maintain the wedge at 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury or the CVP at 5 to 10. Add vasopressors if needed to maintain the mean arterial pressure greater than 90 and to assist with the cerebral perfusion pressure. Keep the brain temperature between 36 to 37 Celsius. How do you calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure? This is the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure gives you the cerebral perfusion pressure. Remember, the mean arterial pressure can be calculated by multiplying the diastolic blood pressure by two, adding the systolic blood pressure, and then divide it by three. The cerebral perfusion pressure is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. The goal is to maintain at least 60 or higher. The closer it gets to 60 or below, it is approaching the level of ischemia and neuronal death. Immediate changes in a patient's therapy like fluid infusion or vasopressor administration are needed to improve the cerebral perfusion pressure. Keep the head of the bed at at least 30 degrees. Establish a baseline neuroassessment because early detection of subtle changes provides the best outcome. Airway breathing circulation. Check the ABGs, the vital signs. Maintain adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. Look for Cushing's triab. The head in a neutral position. The neuroassessment, looking at the Glasgow Coma Scale, the level of consciousness, the eyes, pupils, motor response. Do they have decerebrate or decorticate posturing? What is their response to pain? Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic and will reduce cerebral edema and intracranial pressure. Can also give IV 5% hypertolic saline if they have a very low sodium. A patient's low sodium could indicate that hyponatremia may be causing the cerebral edema and could lead the patient to have seizures. Mannitol should be administered with an inline filter needle. The solution should be checked for presence of crystals. If it is observed, you do not administer the solution. Mannitol may initially reduce hematocrit and increase blood pressure, but these are not the best parameters for evaluation of the effectiveness of the drug. Oxygen saturation will not directly improve as a result of mannitol administration. If the patient has a SWAN, then monitor the CVP and the pulmonary artery pressure. In addition, monitor the urinary output and vital signs, and the patient should be assessed for signs of dehydration since mannitol is a diuretic. The definition of brain death is complete and total cessation of all brain function, including the brain stem. 
Approach of a potential donor's family must be done by a procurement organization representative or an individual trained by the procurement organization. Causes for brain death are intracerebral hemorrhage, head trauma, anoxia, brain tumors, and the clinical exam would be absent brainstem reflexes, no motor response to pain, and apnea. Confirmatory testing would be cerebral angiogram, an EEG, cerebral blood flow, and of course an observation period. An organ donor assessment would include past and current medical social history, laboratory assessment, serological studies, cultures, organ-specific blood work, physical assessment, 12 lead EKG, echo, angiogram, chest x-ray, and bronchoscopy. So all of these would be assessed. Words to avoid if potentially going to discuss organ donation. Do not use the words like harvest life support, one chance in a million, keep alive until donation, only a miracle can save them now. Organ donor management begins with brain death with a donor designation or family authorization. Extensive testing is done to determine organ function, monitoring and responding to rapid clinical changes, and optimizing hemodynamic status with IV access, triple lumen central line, peripheral IVs, and arterial line. The goal is adequate organ perfusion, a systolic blood pressure that would be normal for their age, heart rate between 80 to 100, urine output is 1 to 2 mLs per kilogram per hour, a CVP from 4 to 8, and normothermia. The brain death discussion is a key area of collaboration. After introduction and condolences, one of the donation coordinator's first questions might be something like, what has a doctor told you about brain death or your child's death? Families are finding themselves in often tragic, unexpected circumstances and being told within a relatively short period of time that their loved one who was fine 24 or 48 hours ago is now dead. Studies have shown that a family understanding of brain death is key to whether or not they authorize donation. A family can't possibly authorize any kind of donation if they do not understand that brain death is death.